Hello, welcome knitting friends. Thanks for joining me today. I am pretty sure that we have the sound issues from last week all resolved. So um, if you have any problems hearing my audio, please do let me know. I'm, I put the batteries in correctly this time. So thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, being a part of the conversation. I'm Kelly Vaughn from Knit Swag, and today, as always, we're going to be talking about number knitting. It is the original modular knitting book published in 1952 by the genius Virginia Wisbelmi. And the more I learn about her and her patterns, the more I love her. So um, we've got lots to talk about today. Um, so one of the one of the the people that's helping me the most in this um, kind of like research archival effort. Um, and if you're new here, just so you know, I've been I've been working on this since 2015, I think. I read through all the charts in the book. I um, I'm knitting all the patterns, and it's just it's been a labor of love for many years now. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, a friend who's now a friend, she a, a woman reached out to me on Ravelry and introduced herself and said she was an archival researcher and a knitting enthusiast and wanted to help. And that's Karen. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> Love Karen. Um, so anyway, Karen is my, um, my friend in my archival research pursuit. And she introduced me to something new this week that I hadn't, I hadn't really considered. Um, and it has to do with the archive.org website. Now I've been on the archive.org website before and I've done a cursory search and I didn't come up with a lot. But what Karen taught me this week is that you can do, you can search for like a whole bunch of different information, like different, like where it's hiding. And I thought that would be really, um, really good for, for me to know about, for you to know about. And so I wanna show you what um, what we found, well, what Karen found, and then what she told me about. Uh, let me bring up that window. There it is. Okay, so here is, this is the archive.org website. There we go. Okay. So if you go to archive.org and then you type in, you know, a phrase, um, you can search just for the phrase or um, you can search for like if there's metadata. And if, if you don't know what metadata is, it's like um, description and um, keywords and copyright date. Like there's a whole, I think there's like 50 or 60 different metadata fields like author name, you know, publisher, uh, and if you are using it in, in like a, a graphical sense, it can be like file type. And so there's a lot of different bits of information, different fields that you can look for information. And so Karen's great idea was to search the text contents. And when she did that, because when I searched for Virginia was Bellamy, there were, I just, I think I searched metadata, which was dumb. Like I, sh <laughs> I know better than that. <laughs> I'm in mean, technical publication, technical publishing for a living. Like I know how to search metadata um, and do proper searches, and I, I just it escaped me. But anyway, so this is what Karen found, and there's not just one book. I mean, Virginia is listed in here dozens of times. Uh, she's listed in here for her poetry. She's listed in here for uh, her patent. She's listed in here for her copyright registration cards. She's listed as uh, like a who, who, who's who in America uh, for her poetry. And she's also, this is really interesting, she's listed a, in probably a half a dozen other knitting books. And I knew that she had been listed in, you know, principles, knitting, principles of knitting and in um, domino knitting. But I, I didn't know that she was also listed in modular knits. I didn't know that she was listed in machine and hand knitting pattern design. Uh, that was a 19... 90 book. Uh, I didn't know that she was mentioned in those and I thought wow, that's that's really great. That is <laughs> Spectacular and so what's so cool about this archive.org website is it's kind of like a library in that you can go in you can um, Zoom in a bit you can see like what's there like what is what does she have to say about Virginia? She says in the USA, there is a curious case of Virginia Woods Bellamy, who in 1952 patented a method of dealing with biter, bias knitting and garter stitch as her very own invention. Yes, that's 
awesome. So what's what's different about this, um, in, as far as like, somebody went through the, the whole process of scanning this book, which is great, um, but like for, for books that are not in the public domain, you can't download it. You're like, you can't download a PDF of this. Um, but what you can do is like check it out for for a while and then you have to, um, I guess, you know, I don't know exactly how, how it works. I haven't tried to check one out. But you can you can search through all these old archival documents and find references to all kinds of awesome material um, and really go down a, a rabbit hole of, of a treasure trove of information. And that's, that's what we did this week. And so uh, I forget which one it was on here. It was, um, there was one, the Pathfinder, that I thought was really interesting. So Path... Pathfinder. Here it is. It's in 1949 to 1906. And um, I actually already brought that up in a, um, a separate window. And I downloaded a PDF and I could do that because it is in the public domain. And I don't know how they, how they determined that. Like somebody at some point determined that and made this PDF available for download, which is awesome. Uh, and so Pathfinder was a news magazine from, I don't know when, like when the publishing range was, but it was a news magazine. And um, Virginia mentions this magazine in her introduction. And so if you have a copy of Number Knitting, I hope you do, you should. Um, like, not many people have a hard copy, but if you, you know, get yourself the digital version that's in my Etsy shop and my Knitswag shop. Um, and also I have a whole video where I just read the introduction. And it's a little dry because I was, I didn't have a nice camera set up and I was very nervous. <laughs> but regardless, I have a whole a whole video of me reading the introduction and I encourage you to go watch that video. And so what's so cool about that is um, in the, the introduction of her book here, she goes through the whole story of how she um, came up with the method and um, who she taught with. She taught at the Brickstore Museum and she um, she taught a correspondence course and there's there's a timeline and um, she specifically mentions the the places the magazines in which she had information published about her either patterns like McCall's needlework um, or um, several other magazines like Craft Horizons, uh, Christian Science Monitor, New England Homesteader, Handweaver and Craftsman, and The Pathfinder. And so I haven't checked the archive dot org website to see if all of those are on there but i know at least some of them are on there and that's pretty cool um i was i was kind of struck by this name louise louise jereka in the hand weaver and craftsman and i i do know that one is in there and i thought you know that that article because i i got it and it looked like it felt really familiar like really really familiar and then and then i noticed let's see this so I don't think I have included this. I should. I hadn't included this um, in the the digital version of number knitting. So I have the front cover and I have the back cover. And this these books are awesome, very entertaining. Some of them. Um, but anyway, so I did not include the front the the d front and back of the the flap part. I guess that's what it's called of the dust jacket. So in here. Um, the woman, Louise Jereka, who wrote that article in Hand Weaver and Craftsman, this is like an excerpt from that. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty awesome. And if you're curious, here is the other, um, the other front dust jacket. Um, and there's our beloved Virginia. I think that this, this dust jacket that I have, this is the most pristine version that I've ever seen anywhere from all the books I've seen online like a lot of these books don't even have the dust jacket but mine is like the best <laughs> which I'm I'm so lucky I'm so lucky that I that I got it when I did I I love this book okay so um, if you go to the archive.org um, um, website you can you can do all kinds of interesting research. And I, th I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and download all those articles from, um, from the different um, magazines that Virginia mentioned and just like add them to my, my growing collection of um, all things Virginia, because I'm a fangirl. <laughs> so that, that was really fun. Thanks, Karen, for, 
for pointing that out to me. That was, um, that was great. Because I do a lot of research for my regular job, but it's like for um, owner's manuals and like, you know, how to install your bilge pump and, you know, just like mechanical documents. But it's not like, and, you know, stuff that was preferably published in the last 12 months. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm still kind of getting my feet wet and like getting my brain wrapped around like if I want to find documents that were like from a hundred years ago <laughs> like what's what's the best way to do that so thank you Karen for helping me out with that I am I am learning okay so another fun thing that I noticed in this um, this introduction in that Pathfinder article she mentions in that Pathfinder article that uh, one of her uh, Virginia mentions her daughter's teacher had used some knitting, some of her mom's knitting patterns to clothe her children. So the teacher clothed her children using Virginia's patterns. And I've kind of always been under the assumption that um, the patterns that the teacher used were from the 30s. And they were the Puff Bunny wardrobe. But no, because in that Pathfinder article, it, it talks about how um, she use uh let me find them real quick teacher here we go next her daughter's this is um an author writing about virginia um next her daughter's high school english teacher asked her about her knitting the teacher had dressed her children from mrs bellamy's number knitting designs the first of which appeared in a needlework magazine in 1944. yes and why that is um why that is interesting is, um, is because Virginia put out two numbered inning pamphlets in McCall's in 1944. The first one, numbered inning pamphlet number one, I've, I've showed like the, not the whole thing, but like the, the pictures of the things in the, um, on the pamphlet. And there was like a placemat or a baby blanket. And there was a, like a scarfy sort of a thing. And there was baby shoes and a baby hat and a baby sweater. Um, and the baby sweater had a matching mom sweater. And so I don't know that the teacher would have clothed her daughter in a mom sweater. You know what? Maybe she, maybe she, maybe she made the baby jacket. I'm not sure. I've been kind of debating about that because in the number dating pamphlet number two, there was the Hampton cardigan which, um, which Stephanie made a, a modern day sample of and I, I recharted based on the picture because we don't, we don't have the original pattern. We're working on that. Um, and I thought maybe the teacher made the Hampton cardigan for her kids. But you know, come to think of it, maybe, maybe she did the little baby jacket for pamphlet number one. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out someday. I'm, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, um, this is a really great, it's a great little article in the Pathfinder. This is one of the pictures used in the book. This is Virginia. It's hard to tell, but she's she's knitting uh, Hoyle's Garden Stair in um, in this. Oh, this is really interesting. So see what the caption says? It says hooded butterfly shawl and garden stair counterpane. That is really interesting. So I, I don't know about you, but whenever I see the word um, counterpane, I always think of like a counterpane counter I'm, I'm looking it up right now so I can show you a, a picture um, I always think of something like this right and it's like diagonals that's what I think of when I think of, of a counterpane but in this this article in the Pathfinder it refers to Hoyle's garden stair as a counterpane, which I think is curious. Hmm. Um, and if you're not familiar with Hoyle's garden stair, let me let me show you that real quick. I um I knitted one once, and I was in a pinch for the birth of a baby, not mine, <laughs> so one in the family, and so I sent it along. Um, but anyway, here's Hoyle's garden stair. And it's, it's decidedly different than what I think of a counterpane of in my mind. It's the, the angles are like stair steps as opposed to like the more traditional 
counterpane, which are like four triangles or four squares like sewn together and they're kind of like around the center. So, but this article refers to this as a counterpane, which is, that's really intriguing to me. Um, another thing that I, that I stumbled across in this article, and um, I'll let you, if you want to just pause the video right here for if you're watching later so you can read this. Um, down near the end of the article, it talks about um, the last paragraph. Mrs. Bellamy has had so many requests for in instruction that she is now considering a correspondence course. Meanwhile, a Boston publisher is waiting for material for her, uh, from her for a book on counterpane patterns. Directions in this book, however, will be the row-by-row -row kind. Mrs. Bellamy prefers to teach the principle of design so that each knitter can work out her own creations. So there's a, a couple of things in there that are really interesting to me. The, the counterpanes is, um, that's, that's interesting. That second book that she was planning on never, never happened. So I'd be curious to see what other kinds of designs that she came up with. But also the fact that we finally have a timeline now for when the correspondence course was. And so this was published in June 29th, 1949. She got her patent, she applied for it in 46, got it in 48. Um, the magazine articles started coming out in 49 and she hadn't yet done her correspondence course. So sometime between the summer of 49 and um, 1952, she, um, I don't know if we have a date in here other than 1952. Um, Sometimes publishers will do months, I think. No, we just have the year. So sometime between mid-1949 and 1952 is when she did her correspondence course. And that correspondence course eventually morphed into this. And so we finally, we finally have a date for that, which is great. Um, I've been wondering about that because I thought maybe it occurred like in the mid-40s? No, it was late 40s probably. Um, 1950 51 is what I'm thinking so that's exciting to know um, oh Karen says in this month's piecework magazine they describe a counterpane as a blanket or quilt it evolved from what you were saying Kelly about it being one of four squares to make the design that's interesting that is really interesting yeah the the words the words that we you know, that we use every day used to, a lot of them probably have different definitions or different, you know, understandings, if that's a word. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad we found that information about the counter, counter, counterpane. Yes, <laughs> I've, I've looked at those before and I think, oh, they're lovely. And that would, <laughs> that would take me like 20 years. I, I had a local yarn shop years ago that I would visit every weekend. And the, the woman who ran it was an institution in town. She was amazing. And she told me that one time um, someone had, his, a man, his wife had passed away. And for decades, she'd been working on a counterpane on like triple zero zero needles, lace weight cotton. And she hadn't finished it yet. <laughs> and so this dear old man, he just brought it over to Jan and gave it to her and asked if she could finish it. And she's like... No, I can't because the needles are so fine, they split my fingers. <laughs> like, so that, that poor counterpane blanket that someone had been, probably been working on since the 50s never got done. But in case you're, you're wondering, like if you ever run into this where someone says, oh, you know, my, my aunt died or my grandma died or, you know, whoever, and like they left me the stuff that I'd love to have finished, but I can't. Like if you don't have the time or the like mental energy or the skill, there's a group on Ravelry and I don't remember the name, but I'll find out. And basically they connect you up with other people that do have the time and the energy and the skill. And so you like mail them your, your thing, your unfinished beloved whatever, and they'll finish it and they'll send it back to you. And it's like, wow, that's, that's awesome. Um, note to self, got to start making notes of the, the things I need to get for my, uh, my show notes again. So what would I call that? Um, I'll just call finish it and return it link because I don't know what else to call it. Okay, 
The only time I would be a little hesitant to do that if it was like total garbage yarn. <laughs> And it originally had bad craftsmanship. Then it'd be like, well, I, you know, I can't match the yarn and it can't match the crappy craftsmanship. So like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it'd be more delicate if someone came to me with like puppy dog eyes asking for help with their project from their beloved family member that passed, probably. Um, oh, Stephanie says the group is called Loose Ends. Ooh, all right. I'm going to add that. I'm going to add that to the show notes. That's, that's important. That is a gift to needleworkers around the world. Okay, six, it's 620. Um, all right, so I, I ordered some, as you know, I have this ever, this ever growing collection of McCall's. I still haven't got my scanner, but I will. I'm doing that this summer. I'm gonna scan them all. Um, so I don't know if I mentioned it in the past. I, I, back in March, I ordered I think I ordered three magazines from eBay. Uh, two of them were from one seller and one of them was from another seller and they were supposed to be delivered on the same day. And so, and I was tracking, you know, tracking the, the tracking information. I was like so excited because one of them is, I mean, they're all rare, but one of them was like exceedingly rare. It was like the only copy I've ever found online. Um, so anyway, I was very, very excited and I get the notification, ding, your package has been delivered. I'm like, Oh, yes. So, and it says it was left um, at the front porch and um, there's, then I go check the package on the front porch and it's um, from the other tracking number. And so I check tracking number two and it says it was left at the mailbox. And so I go to the mailbox and there's nothing there. And I asked my mailman about it, the, my mail lady about it the next day. She's like, oh yeah, we had a sub that day. <sighs> and I was like, <laughs> That's it. Um, and she wrote me a nice letter saying basically, yeah, he dropped it off at someone else's porch and flagged it wrong. <laughs> so anyway, I called the I called the post office and they're like, oh yeah, we'll we'll talk to him. <laughs> and then I went to file a claim on the postal service website and they had to wait 45 days. And I was like, fine, I'll wait 45 days. I today was 45, and so I went in to file my claim today, and it said, it, well, let me back up a little bit. My understanding was that the postal service automatically includes, it used to be $50. So whether you bought something that was $1,000 or $100, you only get $50 of insurance unless you specify otherwise. They recently upgraded it to $100. So I thought I had $100 worth of coverage. Um, so I filed my, I went to file my claim and I filled out the tracking number and it said, um, you are not eligible to file a claim for this because there was no insurance. <laughs> which sucks so and it's not it's not like a big dollar amount that i lost it's like less than 14 dollars um so it's not huge it's but it's annoying that the postal service lost my package didn't insure it doesn't care at all and they've got awful service so all of that to say if you have lovely treasures that you're shipping choose a different service provider fedex ups they scan the package when the driver picks it up. You can like track it all over the country, which is, which is awesome. Um, because if you have something that's like irreplaceable, you will at least get your money back if FedEx or UPS loses it. So um, yeah, <laughs> just that's my little rant for the day because I was so, um, I was so irked by the postal service losing my package. And I'm sure it happens like every day. But, and I even reached out to six of my neighbors, six of them, and they're all like, we didn't get it, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I ordered three more magazines today, so, and I, I forgot to request FedEx or UPS, so hopefully, hopefully, UPS doesn't screw it up. Um, but I'm excited, because I think they're both 1945, which is great. Mm. All right, um, oh, hey DJ. That is nice when the neighbors bring your stuff over. That is really nice um, that people are going to be honest and like return things that aren't theirs. And that's a good way to meet your neighbors too. If you have to like go knock on their door and bring them stuff. Um, that actually happened to us when we first moved in here. They, um, well, we, we moved into this house about a year ago. We ordered a guest bed and they, <laughs> it's like a queen size bed. And they, they dropped it off by the house down the street because our address was so new, it like wasn't in their database. To like this 80-year-old 80, 80 couple, they just like dropped off a queen-size bed on their porch and 
<laughs> anyway, the neighbor was like, they just, they just dropped it there and then they left. <laughs> like, we had to go pick up the queen size bed because Mr. 80 year old neighbor was not in the position to bring it to our house. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so we're talking about history still. And um, I had mentioned this a couple of, um, a couple of episodes ago, I think. So about, um, when was it, a year, two years ago? Oh yeah, it was over two years ago. So there's this um, knitting um, researcher. Um, her name is Dr. Lily Marsh. And um, she, she got her PhD. And I don't know specifically what her PhD is in, but the whole thrust of her dissertation was all about Elizabeth Zimmerman and the emergence of critical knitting. So I was talking with Dr. Lily recently and she said she wanted to kind of figure out like when knitting became like an art form as opposed to just like a craft. And so she dug really deep into that and she 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 wrote a whole dissertation on this and she got her PhD. Um, I think it's in American Studies. I'm not 100% for sure. But anyway, she a couple years ago connected up with um, Sarah from Yarns at Yinhu, and she did an eight-part uh, audio series all about her research into Elizabeth and like the history behind it. And um, she talks about number knitting, and it's just it's fabulous. And so if you're you're interested in, I mean, and I'm sure you are because you're like you're watching this video about knitting history mid-century. Um, I would encourage you all to go. Um, to the Yarns at Yinhu website and, and listen to that eight part series. And I think each one is like, I don't know, hour, hour and a half. It's phenomenal. Um, and I've also included a link down in the, um, the show notes to um, Billy's dissertation. And you can, you can download it and read it. Oh wow, she's got 3,300 downloads. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, so download that, read it. It's it's probably a couple hundred pages, but it's a great read. It is phenomenal. So, um, oh, interdisciplinary studies. It was her department. Anyway, check both of those out. Um, they're just, they're really enlightening as far as understanding, understanding like the knitting culture of the time and um, she does she does talk a bit about I think almost for like a whole episode about number knitting and um, and how um, both for Virginia and Elizabeth were like very early adopters of the idea that they could publish knitting patterns under their own name and not just be like some anonymous designer like I have I have this book um, this book here that is from the same the same time frame. It's called Big Book of Knitting. And um, this is from 48. So this is before, um, this is a little bit before Number Knitting was published. And it was edited by Isabel Stevenson, which is, you know, that's noteworthy, but Isabel Stevenson didn't come up with all these patterns. Like anonymous designers came up with these patterns and they were contracted by yarn manufacturers and um, you know it's it's great it's a it's a great book, but it doesn't give any credit to the women who develop these stitches, develop these patterns, wrote the patterns. They're anonymous. They're lost to history. So anyway, if you want, I don't I don't have a link to that in the show notes. I think I just have the name mentioned, but it's big book of knitting. Um, yeah, and that's a that's a great book. And this is an American book. There's also some from the same the same kind of time period in my collection. Um, there's Modern Knitting Illustrated, Practical Knitting Illustrated, and I think like Home Knitting Illustrated. And those are all from the UK. Um, but they're the same the same time period. They have a lot of the, like really really similar patterns. Um, so anyway, if you're looking for for vintage books to add your collection as like a historical resource, this is a good one. All right, let's, oh, some other knitting books I wanted to show with show you, and then we will work on the, the knit along stuff. Okay, 
So I was looking through my my um, knitting library, which is it's respectable. <laughs> it used to be bigger. Um, and I, I think I shared with you the story of my friend Jackie a few years ago. She decided to downsize and like offload her knitting collection, her knitting book collection, like 95% of it. But she said, you have to take it all for $100. And it like filled up my whole Jeep. <laughs> so anyway, um, that was awesome. So I've got a pretty good knitting book collection. But I, I had a weird request. Uh, my, my mom every year uh, at Christmas time, she's like, okay, what do you want for Christmas? And I'm like, well, rare braid yarn, of course. <laughs> and she'll say, send me a link. Like, okay, so anyway, so sometimes I get yarn. And then, but last year I sent her a link to a couple of knitting books. And I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if the, if the light shines on it really well. Yeah, it's Russian. <laughs> So I, I asked for two Russian knitting books for Christmas, and you know what? Mom got them for me. <laughs> so her reply when I sent her the, these, these Etsy listings was something like, you're so weird. <laughs> She's not a knitter or a historian. Love you, Mom. <laughs> Don't worry, she never watches my show either, so <laughs> she'll never see this. <laughs> anyway, um, so why I thought this one was really cool um, this was from 1956, and um, I showed this to, I don't know if you guys ever watched the show Fiber Chats with Irina, uh, Irina Shaw, or Shar, uh, she's Russian, and so I showed her this, and she's like, oh yeah, I can read all of that, and I'm like, oh, that's amazing, I mean, of course she can, she's Russian, so, but anyway, um, I, I bought this because I thought it would be really interesting to just like see how a Russian book from the same time period, you know, roughly, was different than an American book or a British book. And the first thing I noticed was, I mean, obviously, I can read absolutely none of this, like not even the title. Um, I can read the page number. <laughs> it's nine. Uh, but they use a lot of charts. And I don't know exactly what the I don't know exactly what the symbols mean. I could probably suss it out if I really wanted to wrap my head around it. I think I think all of these little straight lines are knits and the little horizontal lines are pearls. That's what I'm thinking. That, that would kind of make sense. Yeah. Um, or I don't know, I don't know how it would be worked in the Yeah, so even uh, odd, even, odd, even. Yeah, that would make sense. The straight ones are knits and the, the horizontal ones are um, pearls. Except if you're working flat. Then I guess the straight ones would be stockinist stitch. And the horizontal ones would be garter stitch. So I don't know exactly how it would work in the round. But uh, yeah, so it's got all these really interesting symbols. And I don't know what, like, I don't know what this fish means. Um, but I just thought it was a really intriguing way of charting. I wonder if this is how the Japanese patterns are, because I've never seen a Japanese like stitch pattern, but I've heard they're really intricate. Uh, I imagine it would probably be pretty intimidating. Yeah, but there's also these, um, I'm guessing these are like twisted stitches, these little X's. Yeah, so this is just, it's fascinating. Love it. And it gets more complicated as you go because then um, there's other symbols that just don't, they don't make any sense to me. That one looks like a Christmas tree. So I'm not sure. Maybe I'll ask Arena someday or, you know, ask, see if I can find some like English translations of Russian patterns. Um, I kind of have a lot of other stuff to do. <laughs> so. This is more of a curiosity for me at this point. Okay, so the reason I'm showing you this mid-century Russian knitting book was because of this pattern right here. And so years ago, I made a cute little garter stitch um, color work blanket. Uh, and I will, let me find that real quick. Um, and I, I did it, uh, let's see where it is. Color blanket. 
pretty sure I could find it. Nope, I can't find it quickly. That's okay. So what I was trying to um, say is I use this in English. This is referred to as twin leaf lace. And I thought it was interesting that it was in this Russian knitting book. And it got me thinking like this is a this is like a knitting instructional book. It's not just stitch patterns, but like in the front, there's like all the, the stuff about how to how to cast on and bind off and all that. And in the back, there's like all these color work chart things, which are lovely. But then there's also this garment construction stuff mixed in. And so this is like a pretty thorough little knitting manual. But the pattern, the version of this that I have came from a Nikki Epstein book. So this Russian one was published in 1952, 56. But this Nikki Epstein book was from, I don't know, maybe like 2010 or so. And if you haven't seen this before, it's been you know out for a while, but it's a good book. It's a good reference book. And what's really cool about this book is that like a lot of the old stitch dictionaries, like the Barbara Walker books, they're I think they're like all in black and white. At least the one I have is. And um, this one is this one is in color. And I don't know if the colors are going to come across on the camera, but like every section has different colors. Like the lace is all in pink, and the flowers are like I don't know purple, and the the flora patterns are all green. Like the layout of this book is phenomenal. I love it. But what I thought was interesting is here you go. Here is the twin leaf lace pattern. And here is the 1956 version from Russian, from Russia. This is the 2000 and whatever version from Nikki Epstein here in the States. And I thought, you know, I wonder, I wonder if I could also find if I could find that in the Barbara Walker book. And I think she's got like, I don't know, three or four of these um, treasuries. I only have one, but there it is. It's not exactly the same, but I didn't scour the whole book to find this because it's like 500 pages long, 400, but it's long. So, but I found this one. I thought, well, that's really interesting. That's very similar to the other twin leaf lace patterns that I have. And so it just it kind of got me thinking about like the whole idea of a stitch of a stitch dictionary because we don't like obviously we know that Barbara Walker is like the you know the stitch dictionary of um, you know for generations but like the the whole idea that there's other knitting books that have within them like self-contained stitch dictionaries is is nice like you don't I probably most knitters, you know, because there's millions of knitters, most knitters probably aren't going to have a Barbara Walker book. I mean, I hope they would someday. It's a great reference book. But like there's there's other books that are also um, that also kind of fill fill that void in, you know, in your library if you don't have the Barbara Walker book. And so this was the first one that that Nikki came out with, I think, um, knitting on the edge. So it's I don't know the, the the difference between all of these other than the like the color and the name. So then she has knitting over the edge, and this has ribs, cords, appliques, colors, and nouveau. Oh, and this blue one is ribs, ruffles, lace, fringes, flora, points, and picots. And then there's a third one. This is cuffs and collars, necklines, corners and edges, and closures. And I have all three because <laughs> my friend Jackie <laughs> sold me her whole library. Um, yeah, so if you're looking for some interesting things to to add to your, you know, knitting repertoire that maybe you want to customize your patterns or they're like, you know, because because I think sometimes like the the whole idea of garter stitch, I love it, I love 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 it, but like sometimes I think it would be cool to have, you know, something maybe a little bit different on a button band or um, like an interesting neckline or something. And so if you if you're wanting to find a way to like dress up your um, your patterns with something just a little bit different, like 
make the complicated part just like a small thing like the collar but not have to you know work like a whole sweater and brioche or whatever uh, like I could probably do I could probably hang handle this this is this is within my capabilities and it's it's not that I don't have like a lot of knitting capabilities because I've been knitting for a long time but like at the end of the end of a long work week my attention span is it's very limited <laughs> so that's why I only do garter stitch for the most part because like if I have to do even like a simple eight row lace repeat I'm like oh I just I have to focus for like more than one minute <laughs> like I have to focus for 15 minutes like ooh, that's that's hard <laughs> hard for me at least it was it was not so hard when I worked at um, like when I was fresh out of college and I worked at a fast food restaurant and like I made you know fries every day then I was like needing a mental challenge but now with my regular work I'm like the whole need for mental stimulation is fully satisfied so <laughs> I, need, I need something simple to do um, which is ironic that that I chose, you know, to make my life's passion Virginia Woods Bellamy because it's like deceivingly simple and the the little bits of information that she just like sprinkles around, they're so easy to overlook and I've screwed up so many times and had to redo it. And so if you screw up on what seems like a simple pattern, good, good, you're you're on your way. <laughs> that's that's part of the process, my friends. You're on your way. All right, so those are my, my knitting books that I wanted to share with you. Um, yeah, and I mentioned it before. So if you would like to help support the channel, be sure if you haven't liked or subscribed, be sure to do that. It actually does help. Um, eventually, at some point, I'm going to get to like the thousand subscriber mark, and I'm kind of a long way from that. But anyway, um, that would help. And also, if you want to like click on the Amazon links or buy a mug or a sweatshirt from my shop. Here is a sample one. This is a Fair Isle personalized. Can you see it? It's kind of bright with the light. But anyway, it's got hearts on it. Anyway, that was something I did before I started YouTubing. Okay, let's talk about, let's talk about the knit along. Um, we do have a couple people that have posted their projects in the Ravelry group for what are we doing? The Hampton shirt, which is great. Um, so we're making progress on that. And if you haven't, you haven't seen that, I will, um, let me show you Hampton shirt. Okay, so originally it calls it Hampton shirt man's sweater. And I think that's because it doesn't use any gauge shifting. Um, and I mentioned before, but I'll say it again if you're new here. This says chest measurement, 42. Okay, it only has one size, that's fine. Um, and it tells you to, um, let's see, one box equals four stitches and four ridges. And that matches here. Um, but the, the problem with this pattern, it says cast on 16 stitches plus 16 stitches. So you would think that the little box um, of which the each mitered square is comprised, you would think that would be, well, that's all covered up. Let me fix that real quick. Hold on. Gonna make that a red border. And there we go. They do not make this, <laughs> they do not make this easy to use. Fill color, transparent. It took me like four years to find that. <laughs> awesome. Okay tech demo fails once again so th you would think that this little square here would be four by four because it says the box is four four stitches and it says each on 16 plus 16 stitches 
but if you actually look at the chart, it's on a three by three box. So that would be 12 stitches. And so if you follow this chart, instead of these instructions, it will come out fitting a small woman, which is what I did the first time. And it fits great. Um, but anyway, so this is the sweater. I did make a stitch calculator for it, which there's a link to that down in the description below. Um, where you can plug in your own um, your own bust measurement and your own gauge. So you don't have to follow this bust measurement or this gauge. You can plug in your information and it will generate your box number. Um, so once you have your box number, then you will use this chart. And there is a link to this down in the description also. So I have redone this from, I think, what I initially distributed because I screwed up. <laughs> which, you know, it happens. Um, so what I did is um, the first row is actually in the final garment, the second row. So you're going to start here and then work back and forth in like a ski track fashion and then go up over the shoulders to the back and do the same thing. And then um, at some point, I guess after you finish, you know, fourth fourth row, you can come down here and do fifth row, but you can also do that later. Um, so anyway, you're going to work in like a ski track fashion up and over the back. And these numbers here on the side, those are the numbers that I use for my gauge for the gauge shifting. So uh, for the these bottom two rows, I knit it on a six, a US six. For the bust area, I used a size eight for the shoulders and down toward you know most of the back i use a seven and then in the low back i'm using a size six and so what that's going to do is it's going to give you some nice um a little bit more room up here in the bust area and taper down in the waist because that's how i'm shaped and that's how i like my sweaters to fit um i i had knitted some sweaters years ago like when i was in my probably my mid-20s and I followed the instructions, you know, in the knitting books, and they were like all square shaped. And I followed the instructions. And even if they had just a teeny bit of waist shaping, I was like, I put them on. I was like, well, that makes me look like I gained about 20 pounds. That doesn't fit right at all. So I didn't knit sweaters for like 20 years. Um, but then I found Virginia's method. And the, the combination of the garter stitch with, um, you know, the, the mitered angles and, and the stitches running in different directions, they just they stretch and it's just... Mm, love it it looks so good okay so that's um, that's Hampton shirt one other thing I, I forgot to mention on on here is I'm I'm doing I'm doing a sleeved version uh, for mine the original vest doesn't have sleeves but if you um, if you look in the um, let's see if I can find it real quick yeah let's Let's go to the Knit Swag website. There it is. Okay, so if you go on the Knit Swag website, click on blog, and then go down to Hampton Shirt Sleeveless Sweater. Um, Virginia has this to say about it. The adaptable pattern of the slip-on sweater for a man may be adapted to a child's shirt or a woman's blouse, to an open cardigan, front bordered, and with sleeves, or open-necked slip-on, long or short-sleeved. And I thought, yes, I shall change it up. And so um, what I'm doing on mine is I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a sleeved version. I added some little underarm gussets. Um, I haven't knit them yet, but I added them to the chart. And and I'm making a sleeved version. So I will, I will show you that. And I think that um, let me see if I can find it. There was a great, a great. Um, article a few years ago in Piecework Magazine and they had there it is yes okay so um, I'll put a link to this in the, um, the show notes this is a great article I've mentioned it before but I mentioned it again because of these sweaters right here so these are ones that um, Virginia knit and they were ob obtained by an art collector I think um, 
when her son passed and her son had, or you know, their, the son's estate sale, somebody picked these up. And what's noteworthy about these is these are all Hampton. So this is the Hampton, the green one is the Hampton card again, which I recharted. Stephanie renit it, it turned out awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. This is also the Hampton. Um, it's got um, sleeves here, like, and these are the little gussets that I'm gonna add to mine. Um, this has like a higher, a higher neckline. Um, I think the original, the original man's version, yeah, it just had a, it had some ribbing, but it was made in like worsted weight yarn. This one is like a, looks like a lace weight or light fingering. Um, and this one is also the Hampton. Um, but this one, let's see if I can, yeah, I can zoom in. Oh, this is good to know. Um, so she went, the, the, the two, so it's five, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, mitered squares high, and she opened it down to the second one. But then what she did is she added this little mitered square border all around the whole thing, which is which is good. I've been kind of wondering about that. And then she added a little, um, looks like little mitered squares around the sleeves, which is which is lovely. So what I did is I'm, um, I made mine I only opened mine up like one square deep, and so it's, I probably should have done two, but it's too late now because I'm not gonna rip out a week's worth of knitting. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, let me show you, let me show you my, um, my Hampton. It's, it's kind of hard to show it all in this close-up camera. Let me see if I can re rearrange some things here. And switch to the bigger camera and yeah yeah that's a little bit better okay so um, what I've got going on here this is um, this is the bottom part so this is the waistline um, so this would be the this is according to the pattern this is the first row the second row the third row the fourth row and then come back for the fifth row and um, you can see that the fifth row was a little, a little narrower. Um, this, so this was knit on a six. These were both knit on six. And you might be wondering, as I was, like, why is this one so much bigger than this one if it's the same yarn and the same needles? Well, this was square one, so I probably hadn't settled into my gauge yet because, you know, swatching. <laughs> but also, this is hand spun yarn, and so parts of it are kind of chunkier than others. Um, which is, you know, that's fine by me. It's all gonna, it's all gonna stretch out and like fit gloriously once I'm done with it. So this is the, the, the front waist and you're gonna be working up. I should have done um, this opening right here. I should have, I should have put it all the way down there, but I didn't. So my opening is not gonna be as deep. And then when you come up here, um, you're gonna work across like this and then then you start working on row six, start working this way. So with row six, you, um, you pick up and cast on, and then for row seven, you pick up and cast on here. So you're not, you have to be sure to leave an opening right there. Um, and the same thing with, the, with this unit here, and then on this final unit, you pick up from both sides. Um, in the original chart, the, the front and the back are not, they're like different pieces, but there is a note on here that you're gonna pick up um, unit 21, pick up from unit 16, and then cast on, cast on, and then unit 24, you're gonna pick up from 13, but she like disconnected them in the, in the chart, which is fine. Just, you know, that's something to, to pay attention to. Yeah, so I'm, I'm almost done with the body of it. Um, this is, let's see, this is row six, seven, eight, nine. So I've got one more unit here. Uh, I think these are, yeah, this is number six. And then I have a, another row of units here to um, do on number six. And then I'm going to go back and, um, and add some, some gussets in here. And you know, I've been kind of thinking about. I think 
talking about gussets a lot lately because in the the copper cardigan um which i've talked about you know for several weeks and it it was ginormous it, it was it was so big on me so big um but i got to thinking about it like why why did it turn out why did it turn out so big so let's take a look and see what what was going on there so we've got the the copper cardigan here and this model she's not a very big person she's she's very petite you can't really see the underarms um i mean maybe that's a gusset there i'm not entirely sure but it it fits her pretty well i don't think that virginia and virginia's photographer would have done any like sneaky photo styling to like you know like they do in the mannequins in the mall where they like clip it back and so it always looks really tight around the waist but then you try it on and it's like you know wearing a potato sack i don't think they would have done that um but anyway so the the chart for this and this chart is interesting because it's um it's like sideways and and this is i think the only chart in the book that's sideways but what's noteworthy about this chart is these little gusset triangles here <sighs> they're dotted and i don't i don't know if normally the gusset triangles are dotted i'm you know what let's check bodice blouse and see if they're dotted there they're not dotted okay there's another one called um evening blouse and that one has gussets. Like that one. Evening Boss, page 210. 210. There we go. The gussets are not dotted. <laughs> oh, good gracious. So. Like, are the, are the gussets on Copper Cardin optional? Like, maybe she just added them after the fact. Like, well, all the other charts have gussets. We'll just see. We'll just dot them in on the chart. And, like, not actually knit it that way. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, good news. The decision has been made. Gussets are gone on Copper Cardigan. They're coming out. So that's exciting. Very, very exciting. So no more gussets on Copper Cardigan. But I think that it would be, I think it, it would help the fit on this one a bit because, um, you know, let me get my calculator or my, uh, let me get my little measuring tape real quick. So if you're debating about if you need gussets or not, go and find your favorite, your favorite sweatshirt or your favorite sweater and measure, measure the armhole. And so I've done that on my favorite sweaters and I like a seven to eight inch deep armhole. If like, if it's seven, if it's like closely more of a, like a slim fitting, like the bigger the sweater is or the hoodie, um, the, the thicker the fabric is like you, you're going to want more, a longer armhole. And so if we measure, if we measure this, this is, this is a seven inch deep armhole. It's like seven and a quarter, seven and a half. And so I could, I could get away with a gusset on this, but I could also not get away with a gusset on this. I'm not entirely sure. So what Virginia did on the copper cardigan was she made her gusset a whole other unit. And so what that did essentially was add an extra four inches <laughs> deep to the armhole, which is like too much, it's too much. But if you look at, um, at like this one for evening blouse, the the gusset is very petite it's like like if unit seven was a full mitered square then the little gusset it just covers half of that so it's going to be like just an inch and a half or two inches deep instead of adding a full-on four inches to the armhole because the the issue with having an, like an extra four inches in your armhole is that's an extra that falls right at the bust line and so essentially what you're doing is adding like <laughs> I don't know, at least four or maybe like eight inches extra fabric like around your boobs, <laughs> which 
maybe it's comfortable. I think for me, for my body, it looks ridiculous. But so anyway, think about your gussets. Think about your fa the depth of your favorite armhole. I haven't I haven't decided for sure if I'm going to do gussets on this or not. Maybe they'll be small because this is a 16 by um, yeah, this is a 16 by 16 square. And so I could either do it like on an eight by eight or I could do it smaller. I could do it like on a five by five and just have a, like a little itty bitty gusset, which would probably work fine too. So maybe I'll do that. Maybe like a, maybe like a five by five or a six by six gusset, just like an inch. I think that'd be nice. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's Hampton shirt. Um, you know, Karen says that she, Virginia might have added dotted lines to demonstrate an option for her knitters. You know, I, I thought that's true, but the thing is she doesn't, um, she doesn't list it as optional. She didn't list it as, as optional at all. I think she just mentioned it like as being part of card de, um, part of the sweater. Let's have a look. Okay, so uh, to knit, blah, 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 uh, to wrist border, PK. You know, she doesn't even mention the gussets. Huh. Oh, hold on. Here it is. Seam together at center rack, every other unit row and under arms. Sew gusset units at back into front. I see why they're dotted. Okay. Ugh. This is why we need help going through, like I need your help going through all this together because if we weren't talking about it, I never would have figured this out. Okay, so the reason these things are dotted is because she drew them only on the back. Like this is where you do your gusset. And then what she's saying, um, so, so gusset units add back into front. And so you're going to fold this in half, um, like, you know, fold it. And then this top edge here is actually going to fold over and is going to be seamed into there. So she didn't she didn't list that as optional, but it should be because it doesn't fit right with the gussets. <laughs> it's just, it's too big. Anyway, enough about gussets. <laughs> oh, I'm, you know, I think part of it, the issue is, is that Virginia was her own editor as far as I know. Um, and so she's just a little cryptic sometimes. Like you just, it's just not always clear what she's trying to get across. And it's not until you actually like redraw the chart. And even that is not for sure. Like you have to actually knit through the whole thing and actually try to do it. And then you come into these stumbling blocks and you're like, oh, okay, I get it now. But like, it's the the instruction and the writing was not was not as clear as I think modern day knitters are accustomed to. <laughs> anyway, we figured it out. <laughs> we, we figured out a better way. Um, also, Hampton cardigan, because she talked about, you know, you could do it as a children's sweater, as a woman's sweater, as a cardigan, as a slipover and all that. And so I thought, well, shoot, I'm going to do that. Um, and so I have my main one that I'm working on, but then I also decided I'm going to do like a kid version. And so I went onto my, my handy dandy stitch calculator and I, I calculated out how many stitches I would need for a toddler. Well, first I had to figure out how big a toddler was because, you know, like I don't have kids. I don't have any toddlers around to measure, but I was like, that feels about like a toddler. Like if I was to pick up a kid, I, a toddler, I think his chest would be about that big. <laughs> I was like, that seems like about 20 inches. And so that's what I plugged into my stitch calculator for the chest measurement, 20 inches. I cross-checked it and it says an average toddler, like, I don't know, two or two and a half is like 19.75. And I was like, 
okay yeah so toddler sweater um, so I'm doing the Hampton the Hampton sweater but I'm doing a littler version because that's more attainable um, so if you're doing the knit along but you're like the big one is kind of intimidating just make a little one this still counts oh and there's prizes <laughs> of course <laughs> um, yeah so I did unit unit one and then I'm, I'm doing like every other garter ridge a different color so normally when and I mentioned this before normally when you're doing a mitered square the inclination is to rotate it this way and pick up this edge but in this pattern you don't do that at first you pick up this edge and work that away and then on row two you work that away and so forth um, so anyway this is this is the start of the Hampton cardigan for a baby well I guess a toddler so the, the reason I wanted to do this is because I was invited to two baby showers and I thought I got a hat but like just just a hat seems like insufficient um, I mean even though I spent like 10 hours on it it's <laughs> if it's just a hat it seems a little insufficient so I thought I could maybe whip up a couple of sweaters real quick so we'll see how that works <laughs> I've got a road trip next week and I think if it doesn't rain again so that'll be like six hours of knitting time so surely surely over the weekend I could make a sweater all right is there anyone besides me who is doing the bodice blouse with cape scarves has anyone tackled that yet and if not that's okay <laughs> it's a little intimidating um yeah it's a little intimidating so let's look at the pattern together this has yeah two pages this is the one that I redrew um, because the one in the book was very difficult to understand uh, but hopefully this is this is going to make it easier the color coding indicates needle size and those color codes are down here on the left um, Virginia gave us a little road map to tell us like what you know as we're knitting the units what needle size we should use so we've got you know both the color coding and um, the non color coded kind of a tabular version that Virginia did for us yeah so I am not nearly as far along in this as I thought I would be at this point because um, <laughs> this this sleeve good gracious it's it's amazing it's it's so big you know I I did the I did the numbering according to the way that she said like my box number I think is I don't know, 12 let me check real quick because she listed a few different box numbers to use yeah so if you're small size 30 or 32 your um, box number is a uh, 10 yeah box number is 10 if you're small if you are a Size 34, your box number is 11. I say 36, your box number is 12. And I'm a size 36, and so I'm doing a box number of 12. And um, which is not a big deal for units one and two. Okay, cast on 36 by 36, fine. It's like, you know, not a big deal. Got through those pretty quick. But then I needed to cast on 72. So you're working a 72 by 72. Uh, stitch miter square <laughs> and it it takes forever it takes forever okay so here is whoo, um this is unit one and then unit two you know that went fairly quickly but then this sleeve <laughs> like takes up the whole desk And I think, watch, I'm going to have to rip it all out. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be something? Where's my tape measure? Did I lose it? There it is. All right. Okay. I'm probably going to get a very, a very hard learned lesson again about swatching. But I've, I followed the instructions. I followed the instructions. 
Good gracious. All right. I have not, you know, this is dry. I haven't, you know, washed it or blocked it or anything. I just want to measure the diameter, the length of this thing. So this is a 26 inch. Yeah, this is going to be a 26 by 26 inch square. And so the way it, it works is that I think right about here, it folds over, right? So this is going to be the, this is like the front, this is like the front waist, this is like the front chest, and then this whole gigantic sleeve thing, you're going to seam it. And then so it's like this big blousey sleeve, very blousey. Um, it seems, it seems a little long. Let's see how long my arms are. I haven't done that since, like, <laughs> how does, how does one measure the length of their own arms? It seems like I need a buddy for this. <laughs> oh, so I took a sewing class in college because I majored in home ec, um, before they changed it to a more politically correct name. And we had to, you know, buddy up and, you know, take measurements to make our clothes. And so I'm looking at this and from my shoulder to my wrist is 22. And this is, this, what did I say, 26? I think this is 26. So it's kind of, it's kind of blousey, but you know, that's, that's okay. Let's see what it looks like on the, yeah, I think it's going to work. Because if you look at it on the pattern, on the, in the book, it's, uh, it's got this little cuff thing, but then it's, you know, it's very blousey and it like kind of pools around her, her wrist. And I, I think it's going to work fine. Yeah. It just, it takes forever. Um, and in uh, keeping, keeping in the spirit of consistency for my yarn acquisition um, needs, did I buy enough yarn? <laughs> I didn't buy enough. So I bought three skeins of this, like this blue stuff. And I thought that'll probably be enough. And I'm, I've, I've used up a full two of them and I'm not even halfway through the sweater. So I'm thinking, <laughs> thinking just to be on the safe side, I'm just going to buy five more because, because <laughs> last time when I did copper card again, I bought three and then I was like, oh, I'm out of, I'm running out of yarn. I'll buy two more. That still wasn't enough. I think I ended up buying seven skeins of yarn for that copper card again. <laughs> and it weighs like a pound and a half. So that's going to be warm. But anyway, these are, those were, I think, 100 gram skeins. And this, this wool stock is um, like 50 gram skeins. Maybe I should buy a, another, um, another skein of the light blue too. Because for, for my sweater, the whole under sweater bodice part and the, the poofy sleeves, it's all this dark blue. But for my cape scarf thing, it's, um, it's like a lighter blue. And of course, I was like, I'm just going to need one of those. Well, I'm pretty sure that's also incorrect. So I'm going to go buy another, <laughs> another six skeins of yarn because <laughs> that's how I roll. Um, Anita says, when you pick up stitches the other way, do all the edges look the same? I think, I think Anita, you were referring to, you were referring to this. And the answer is, is no. So all of Virginia's patterns, most of her patterns in the book say, they're solid color. And so it's like not, um, it doesn't matter if there's going to be these little pearl blips, but like if I go and I pick these stitches up here from the, the wrong side, there will indeed be little pearl blips. Which, you know, it's not a, 
it's not a big deal because you know for this is like a funky little kid sweater but like if that bothers you and for certain projects that bothers me so you are going to have these little pearl blips and if um, if i wasn't doing striped you'd have like nine pearl blips there but what you can do if you don't like the pearl blips um and i i don't know if i've done a whole a whole video on this yet or not i i figured out a way get Mr. Yellow out of here. He's in the way. There we go. So I figured out a way to avoid that. So you stretch your yarn across across the square and then roughly double it. And then you start there. And then you pick up from the front side. So you pick up one stitch with your tail and then one stitch with this stranded portion. And then one stitch with the tail and one stitch with the stranded portion. And it gets it fairly close to using up all of this stranded portion. And sometimes, you know, I have to kind of finesse it a little bit um, to make it work. But you know, it's, it's close. And so I've got all my stitches picked up from the front side. Um, and there's no pearl blips, which is nice. Now, it does look a little bit different on the back side because you've got this, um, this stranding right there, like every other row is stranded. But like if it's the back side, like who cares? But I like this because it gives it a degree of flexibility and like stretchiness that that Virginia's method in the book doesn't doesn't offer as much and so what she has you do is she will have you um, when you you know need to pick up like if you need to start here if you need to start at another point um, other than right here in this corner what she'll have you do is just like stretch the yarn over and then do like a weaving in Let's see if I can do it there we go and so if you're, if you're familiar with the idea of um, weaving over and weaving under, I think it's pretty common in Feral. So you just like trap it in there and then leave it behind this time and do a knit stitch and then you're gonna bring it over and you're gonna do a knit stitch and so it, it traps it. But I find that that, it doesn't have the same degree of flexibility because it's it's ultimately you got this this length of yarn there and I suppose you could just like have a little extra in there and like stretch it out and it'll kind of like it won't be as tight um, but you could do it you could do it either way either you know my method where you you know one stitch from your regular yarn and one stitch from the floated yarn or Virginia's method where you just trap the whole thing it's totally up to you you're welcome. Okay, Karen wants to know if I drape that sleeve over my body. You know, I should. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> oh. Gosh, I'm learning. I'm learning so much. I should swatch. I should try on my garments. Oh, dear. I should buy enough yarn. Someday, someday, I'm going to be like really good at all this stuff. <laughs> I, I won't make such dumb mistakes. Okay, how does this thing work? Okay, oh, this is the left side. Jeez. All right. So it's going to go about here. And then, can you, can you see this? Yeah, it's kind of long. It's kind of long. Oh. So it is going to be, you know, kind of drapey, and um, the sleeves are going to be very loose. They, this seems a little looser than in the book. This is like, well, it's a 36 inch square, so it's like, you know, minus the width of my arm, so we'll take off about 6 inches for that. So this is about 15 inches, I think. Let's have a look. 15 inches deep sleeve. Well, that's centimeters. Yeah, maybe 14. 
that's um, 14. Let's see how the picture in the book looked. It's pretty, it's pretty blousy. I mean, maybe not quite as blousy as mine. I don't know. <laughs> what do you guys think I should do? <laughs> Rip it out? Make a smaller sleeve? I don't know. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> you know what I could do? I could find a tall friend. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and then I'll just I'll just count this as my swatch. I'll find a tall friend and I'll, then I'll make one for me, which is kind of how I roll. <laughs> All right. I need to ask to see the vest again. <laughs> I need a, there's another podcast called Not Quite Enough Yarn. She has <laughs> your kind of yarn problem. <laughs> Except that she gets a lot of stripes. <laughs> I do have a problem, don't I? So I'm never going to run out of this yarn, which is great, because I spun it myself, and I have I have pounds and pounds and pounds of this roving. Well, yeah, I have at least a couple pounds of this roving, and so <laughs> I won't run out. I could probably make five sweaters and not run out. Okay, so Anita wanted to see the vest. There we go. Um, this is the vest. I should have made mine down here, but I didn't. So it's going to be like, mine is going to come, oh, sorry. I don't mean to touch the pop filter. Was it all staticky there for a minute? <laughs> the patience of Job. <laughs> oh, you know, fortunately for me, I don't have the friends that Job had because <laughs> if I remember correctly, his friends sat around and like were miserable with him and told him horrible things but maybe i need to reread the story maybe they were nice i forget it's been a while since i read job <laughs> job was great job was great he he did have the patience of job um he had great patience but i don't know if his friends friends did um job though if i remember correctly he was so miserable he grabbed like a piece of pottery or glass or something and sat in a heap of ashes and was just like cutting himself up to die. So, <laughs> woo! <laughs> but then he was redeemed, so it all, it all worked out for Job. <laughs> okay, so this is the vest. Um, this is the vest. What did you want to see about it? This is um, the fifth row. So one, two, three, four, five. And then six, seven, eight, nine, and then I need to do row ten. And I may or may not add gussets. That is that is to be determined. I think what I need to do is measure is go and measure my favorite sweater. Because this is gonna be kind of a close fitting sweater. So um, I'm a thirty I'm a thirty-six and so this is going to have a little bit of a negative ease because I think that looks good. Um, or maybe a lot of negative ease. <laughs> so if I was a... So... 36. So normally, I guess it would be like 18 inch. That would be... Yeah, I think I'm going to add gussets. Yeah. So if it, uh, half of 36 is 18, this is how big it would be. Um for half of a sweater laying flat. And interestingly, so this is like 13 and a half inches across, but this is on size eights, I think. And here down in the, the bottom where I use the smaller needles, it's only a half an inch smaller, but this is more, more loose. And it will open up some because of this neckline. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna add gussets. Uh, Karen has a question. I have a Hampton vest question. I plugged my number into your QR code and the gauge is telling me three stitches to the inch. <laughs> Do I just grab a knitting needle and go? No, in in the, um, in the, let's see, where is it? The stitch calculator, let me, let me find it real quick. Um, and swag, there we go. 
in the stitch calculator, there's, there's two yellow boxes. And the yellow boxes indicate that you can change the numbers in there. So like if you want six, oh, tab doesn't work. Six stitches to the inch at 42 inches would be your box number is 32. But like if your bust is um, 36 and you have six stitches to the inch, your box number is 27. But like if you want four stitches to the inch, you can change the gauge. Both of the yellow boxes are changeable. Does that help? Oh. Um, as far as if you just grab a knitting needle and go for it, that's what I do. <laughs> which is which is maybe why my latest sweater is going to have like a t like ten inches of negative ease, <laughs> but it's going to look hot. <laughs> oh man. Um. Yeah, so, so with the, the bodice blouse, the way it's like, it's so big, I, I kind of feel like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press through. And I feel like I need to just like follow it through to completion, even if it looks really big right now. Um, it's probably not going to get any smaller. I mean, I suppose I could try to shrink it, but that seems a little unpredictable and a little irresponsible. But like, I want to, I want to follow Virginia's instructions, like to the letter as best as I can, and just see what happens, and um, you know, make adjustments next time. Yeah, because I feel like, I feel like if I second, if I second guess her, there's something I have missed. Like, and I did that. Like, here is this, this. Um, what is this called? Tropical Leaf Car Throw, which we just finished um, a while ago. And some folks are still working on it, and that is okay. Let's see, that one. Okay, so um, here we go. So this is the Tropical Leaf Car Throw. This is the cast on edge, and it's all folded up right now, so you can't see the whole thing. It's, it's big. Um, originally, Virginia said, this is unit one, and this is unit two, and like this other chevron, because this is a chevron, is unit three. And then you come back later and like fill in these triangles right here. But did I do that? No. I was like, well, I don't want to fill in the triangles later. I want to do them now. And so what I did is I worked, I worked in Tarja. In Tarja? Intarja, yeah, where you cross, where you cross the, the yarns. That's what I did here. And so I knit this purple and this pink like at the same time. And after I did it, and I, you know, I got further up in the blanket. I was like, oh, okay, I, I get it. I get it now. Why she wanted you to knit these separately. Um, yeah, it, it made more sense to me later. And I kind of wish, I wish I just followed her instructions, but I didn't, you know, because I'm, I'm stubborn. <laughs> And I think I know better. Of course I don't, but anyway. So that's why I'm gonna just like push through on this bodice blouse, even though it's probably gonna take like three times as much yarn as I anticipated and it may or may not fit. That's okay. It's this whole thing is a is a grand experiment. So um I'm so glad, Mishi B, that you like the stitch calculator. It I like it too. That one was a pretty a pretty easy one. The diamond design sweater for women, which there's also a stitch calculator for that one. Whew, that one was a lot more difficult. Um, Hampton, the Hampton shirt is is just, you know, stitches that you have to calculate. And um, there's no bias calculating, but the, the diamond design sweater, the whole thing was on the bias. And so it was like, that's a lot harder, which I think that's why Virginia only included one size in the book. Um, for diamond design because it's hard to calculate the number of stitches you need without Excel. <laughs> All right, so it's 7, it's almost 7.30. Is there anything else you wanted to see or um, talk about before we call it a light? I'm going to get my notes out so I know what I need to do for next week. Oh, there they are. Okay. Um, I am, 
Hold on, I'm reading the chat. Yes, Anita, if you keep on the, um, let me show you something about, about clockwise versus counterclockwise real quick. It's, it's important. Uh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, if you pick up your stitches counterclockwise, there we go, and you just keep working counterclockwise, mitered squares, what you get is the mulberry bush blanket. And um, let me show you that really quick, mulberry bush. It, it is a lot more intuitive. Here we go. So this is mulberry bush. So if you start here and you just, the whole thing is worked counterclockwise round and round and round. And incidentally, this was, I think, one of the patterns in McCall's number dating pamphlet number two. Um, it was also in the same pamphlet with the, the Hampton cardigan. Yeah, so you just knit round and round and round. It's, it's super fun. And I'm honestly surprised that no one else in the modu modular knitting world has, um, has caught onto that because there's lots of you know scrappy blankets modular knitting blankets but like all the diagonals go in the same way and and mulberry bush is neat because like the diagonals <laughs> they like change throughout the whole blanket which is super fun um and it's addicting yeah love mulberry bush okay so um as far as what i'm going to do for next week um i am going to put the the loose ends link into the show notes and um, I should have the body of this Hampton cardigan done and seamed by next week and so I can like try it on and, and <laughs> make adjustments. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll bust a shirt. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I made it too much negative ease and it'll be like, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. But you know, it's, it's alpaca and alpaca stretches and grows and it doesn't have much memory and you know so I'm hopeful I think it's gonna fit I'd rather it be too small than too big um, so yeah so <laughs> oh Bob wants to know if I don't slip the first stitch and purl the last stitch would it be easier to pick up not for me it might be for you a lot of modular knitters they prefer the purl bumps and they like to pick up in those little they call them nobbles or nubs um, I think Wooly Thoughts, Pat Ashworth and Steve Plummer in that, in their book, that's how they do it. I think all the Stephen West designs, he has you like do the pearl bumps, um, instead of the slip stitch. Personally, I like the slip stitch. I think it's easier to pick up, but that's totally up to you. It's, it doesn't matter whichever you like, try both ways and see what, what works for you. Yeah. Some people don't like it because it, um, I think it, it looks like a, when you have the garment, let me see if I can find a good, good example. Here's one. It can look, is this, oh, the whole sweater's inside out. Here we go. So if you have the chain stitch edge, and you like that chain stitch outline, it, I mean, it makes a nice outline. Um, some people don't like that because they feel like it looks like a seam. I personally like that, but it's, I mean, it's up to you. Uh, if you. If you like the chain stitch, but you don't like that seam, you could just put that on the back side. And so, um, then it would look like this. You still have all the nice, you know, nice pickups, but it doesn't have that really distinctive chain stitch edge there. So it's whatever, whatever you like. Your choice. All right, friends, I think that's it for me today. And once again, I'm uh, happy to report that my voice is getting so strong from, <laughs> from chit-chatting with you guys on Sunday nights. Yeah, it's, it's great. I used to get kind of sick if I would talk too much and then I'd like, 
I just get pretty bad throat infections and my throat muscles are getting so strong now. So thanks for that. All right. I think that's it for me. I will, um, I'm going to work on my Hampton vest and my bodice blouse. I think I'll have the, the, the ginormous sleeve finished next week and like maybe even the back part, um, working on the back part and I'm going to keep plugging away on that little baby Hampton that I started today. So that'll be fun. All right. Um, yeah. So thanks for coming all. It's been great chatting with you and, um, until next week. Bye.